what's the history of mending? This is what I'm going to try to answer in today's video. Hi, my name is Matilda and welcome back to Miss Matty, the channel where I share all about sewing, knitting, mending and generally how to live an awesome and sustainable life and if that sounds like something for you please consider hitting the subscribe button and hit the notification bell so you will not miss any upcoming videos from me so ironically before starting to film this video i walked into a doorknob and my shirt got stuck in it and now it has a tear Initially, when I started to research for this video, I thought I was going to find loads of academic research on mending. Wrong. But then I found this article by Anna Koenig. In the article, A Stitch in Time, Changing Cultural Constructions on Crafting and Mending, she argues that that might be because mending was seen as commonplace and mundane. And it was probably not of interest to many. I think many people maybe found French court dress and corsets more fun to write about than mending. It might also be that mending was associated with low socioeconomic status. The scarce academic literature suggests that it hasn't been interest to many. Koenig then goes through in her paper when and where mending start to appear in academic research and if you're interested to read her paper i will link to it in the blog post that is associated with this video which i will link to as well in the description box down below so you can check it out if you're interested but in short it seems like mending mainly has been mentioned in passing and never really been the main source of research therefore to make this video i had to like try to put together as many of the small fragments that i could find uh, to create as a complete picture of history mending as i possibly could there might be things lacking that i couldn't find in this video so if you know anything that i didn't cover let me know in a comment down below. I would love to hear from you and research this subject further. Just to clarify, this video focuses on mending clothes in Western Europe and North America, as well as I include a bit of Japanese mending history later on in this video. However, if you have knowledge about mending in other parts of the world, I would love to hear from you. Uh, so let me know in a comment down below. So now let's get into when did mending start? I couldn't find any resources on when we started to mend clothes, but I would assume because resources were scarce for most of history, so I would assume that we started to mend clothes once we had started to develop the skills to make clothes. New location, the realities of working from home. Throughout most of history, resources have been scarce and it's been very labor intensive to make clothes. Imagine like before the industrial revolution, you had to hand spun yarn and then you had to weave it or knit it into fabric, hand sew it and so on. And that took a lot of time, so of course you cared for your garments because you most likely didn't have time to make more and the resources available to make more, so you had to make sure that you could wear it for as long as possible. Even for wealthy people, clothes and fabrics were valuable and they were worn for a long time. Clothes were repaired and then later on garments were refashioned into new garments to suit the current fashion. In England, you could also pawn clothes, which made them even more valuable to maintain and care for. This slowly stopped to be the case due to the increased manufacturing of clothes. But even the first ready-to-wear garments were designed to last many owners, to be repaired and to be refashioned. For many people, usable clothes were never thrown away, they were always repaired, patched and darned. This was of course necessary due to economical reasons and clothes were used, inherited, refashioned and reworn until they were completely worn out. Then the clothing was used to fill pillows, weave rag rugs and used for rags cleaning. Most literature on the subject suggests that mending was predominantly a 
female activity. Well, it's true that many was something that kept many women busy and it was often the women's responsibility to be resourceful in the household. This has not been an activity that solely has been performed by women. For example, men working away from home, such as fishermen who also needed their own jumper, had to be able to darn their socks and their jumpers themselves. Other men working away from home for a prolonged period of time also had to be able to mend their own clothes. And we shouldn't forget the wallets, the male servants who were responsible for an employer's wardrobe and personal belongings, and they also had to know how to mend and don and take care of their employer's wardrobe. There are also archive pictures from the early 20th century that shows boys being taught how to mend in school, and this was often due to economic necessity. I've got enough coupons. And I've got to have a few for towels and things for the house. Perhaps we can help you. And who may you be? Your old clothes, put away and forgotten. During World War II, it was time to ration, reuse and make do mend. Make do mend was also the name of the famous British Board of Trade campaign. And during the war, it wasn't just that it was essential and economical to mend, but it was also a display of patriotism to repair and reuse. During the 20th century, a big shift happened when it came to how we produce and care for our clothes. During the mid 20th century, when women started to work away from home and ready to wear became more common, the expectation that clothes should be mended started to, not started to, but slowly sort of stopped. And mending started to be seen as old fashioned and unnecessary. Also in some instances, in the context of emerging economies, mending has been seen as the antithesis to progress, economic growth and consumer capitalism. Therefore, it is understandable in the context of the post-war era that when you all of a sudden had plenty of choice of new and fun modern clothes that you would like to wear that instead of the old. And I think as well, many people associated old and mended clothes with the war period. So they really felt like, no, I want to have something new and fresh. And as a result, mending was no longer a skill that was passed down through the generations and throughout the upcoming decades. Mending went from something that we did out of necessity to something you could choose to do if you like. Simultaneously, it's been a huge shift in our society in what we consider useful knowledge. Whereas like more high-tech skills are now seen as important and domestic skills doesn't seem to be seen as relevant anymore, according to some. As more budget-friendly options started to hit the high street in the 1970s, it was no longer seen as necessary to reuse materials. And it wasn't always possible either due to the low quality fabrics in some instances. So from what I understand, this is another factor that made more people lose interest in mending when they discovered that the materials were not of as good quality as before. And this shift you can really see if you look in sewing books during this period. If you look in sewing books pre-1950s, you will notice that most of them almost all have extensive chapters on mending techniques and how to do garment renovations and refashion pieces into something else. And then in the 1960s and the 1970s, there's still often mending chapters, although they slowly start to be removed. But in the sewing books from the 1960s and the 1970s, the chapters on mending are way more simplified than before. And then from the 1980s, they are very rarely included. For this video, I checked several sewing books to just double check that my observation about these were correct. I was double checking in many sewing books from 100 years ago, 150 years ago, 1940s, 50s, 60s, 70s and 80s. And I also asked some of my friends to check for me if they didn't mind. 
and my friend Alex went around and checked in her sewing books and knitting books and I also asked my friend Evelyn Wood who has a great YouTube channel that you should check out if you do not know her already uh, who I think said in a video or on Instagram I cannot remember where but I actually reached out to her and asked her as well and her take on it was that similar to mine like pre 1950s there were extensive chapters on mending techniques and garment renovations simplified chapters on mending in the 60s and 70s and beyond the 1980s Evelyn confirms that she had only seen a mending being included in the Reader's Digest, a complete book on sewing. The domestic work of sewing was seen by some women during the 19th century as an obstacle to education and this idea was later on articulated by second wave feminists as an example of women's unpaid but expected labor. In Koenig's article, which I mentioned earlier, she mentions that it's been in the past couple of generations a form of pride among some women to say things like, I can't even sew on a button, as a way to react the traditional domestic role. And the availability of sheep clothing has then offered them the option to reject this form of labor. But this dismissal of skills then becomes a class issue instead. For example, now many middle class women happily pay another low wage woman to do this work for them instead. Whereas a woman with less disposable income, such as the woman who make these repairs, wouldn't be able to have that choice. Crawford wrote in an article in 2009, What ordinary people once made, they buy. And what they once fixed themselves, they now replace entirely or hire an expert to repair. I think this quote illustrates so perfectly how things have shifted from the mid 20th century until now. While I totally understand the desire to reject women's unpaid but expected labor, I do find it so strange that so many consumerist practices are sort of created in the name of women's liberation. For example, throwing away clothes instead of mending them and uh, using cling film and other disposable products in the kitchen just to mention some. What about men picking up needle and thread and mend the family's clothes instead? Just saying. <laughs> the notion of unpaid labor seemed to have been shaking off entirely with the resurgence of mending in recent years. This might be because it's become a social activity through repair cafes and mending groups and also it's become more like a hobby and a leisure activity rather than unpaid labor. Historically, the skills of buying clothes and other items, interacting with dressmakers, tailors, mending, reducing, renovating garments and so on was all done with the support of mothers, daughters and sisters who shared skills, tasks and resources together. Now these skills are instead shared in groups that meet and mend, repair cafes, on Instagram as well as here on YouTube. For example, I myself have several mending tutorials here on my channel and I will include a link to a playlist with all of those videos in the description box down below so you can check those videos out if you're interested. Previously, mending was seen as a very private affair something people did behind closed doors and now it is a social activity as i mentioned earlier a leisure activity and now we even share our mending on social media through hashtags like monday mending visible mending darning etc domestic sewing is now also seen as an act of self-sufficiency and ingenuity as a positive active form of engagement with commodities that takes us from a passive consumer to an active maker. Author and craftivist Betsy Greer says in her book Craftivism from 2014, in our consumerist society, it's pretty amazing if you fix something, be a sheep and clothes over time. Greer further says, in a society where we throw away things so quickly, making by hand or repairing is a radical act, mending is a small way to think about what we consume and why we consume and what's important and precious. I'm back, my battery died, <laughs> but I'm back now and let's continue talking about the history of mending. When we mended something, it punctures that illusionary idea of perfection 
and gives the object wabi-sabi, the Japanese philosophy that centers around the idea of transience and imperfection. And when it comes to aesthetics, wabi-sabi is about appreciating the beauty of the imperfect, the impermanent, and the incomplete. Hi, editing team Matilda here. I just wanted to add something that got lost when my camera battery died, and that is to expand on this idea of uh, perfection in the West. Uh, what I mean by that, in comparison to like Wabi Sabi, where we celebrate the imperfection, it's that we do not accept goods that have any faults, unless it is uh, five dollars from an unmentioned fast fashion brand. All of a sudden, we do accept the faults because it was so cheap. But otherwise, we do not. Like for example, when we buy a new iPhone, we expect it to have no cracks, no scratches and look really pristine, right? So that's what I mean when I say that mending breaks that illusionary idea of perfection because all of a sudden your item is no longer perfect and new anymore. Today we mend mainly due to personal interest or rather than economic necessity. This might be the reason why there are more classes today on how to darn, as well as the growing number of mending books on the market. For example, I have Mending Matters here by Katerina Rodebach. I think that's how you pronounce the name. Yeah, wrote a Anyway, it's a really good book that I highly recommend. And this is just an example of one of many mending books that have been released in the past couple of years. Although these are choices that help you save money in the long term as you will not need to pay anyone else to do the mending for you and you do not need to replace your items as often, they still require that initial investment to buy a course or a book. Another strong motivator for the modern mender is environmental sustainability. And this is led mainly by slow movements rather than anarchist or anti-consumerist movements. Although I'm pretty sure there are plenty of menders out there that are led by those as well. In the past, the goal with most men's was to make them as invisible as possible. But recently, we have been embracing visible mending as a way to showcase that our garment has been mended and has been loved for a long period of time. Fashion revolution, which if you do not know, which I would be very surprised of if you didn't, but I'm sure there are humans out there that do not know what fashion revolution is. And if you're one of those people, fashion revolution, which is a global movement that started as a response to the catastrophic event of the Rana Plaza collapse on April 24th, 2013, started a couple of years ago, a campaign called Loved Clothes Lost, where many menders have joined in ever since, showcasing their visible mends and other types of repairs. I have been thinking about something for a while and I haven't heard anyone actually say this, so this is just my own take on it, but I would dare to say that visible mending is today's anti-fashion. Let me know what you think. Rei Kawakubo, the queen of anti-fashion, said in the 1980s, Let's get rid of the ideas that have been around for a long time, such as folklore and traditions, and let's start again with something new. I find this quote so interesting because I totally understand where she was coming from when she said this, but today I find that we often look at exactly folklore and traditions, especially when it comes to garment construction and techniques, but then we use them in conventional and new ways. This is, however, my take on it, and I would love to hear from you and what you think about this. Is visible mending the new anti-fashion? And if you're interested to learn more about anti-fashion, The Stitches has a really good video here on YouTube about it, so I will link to her video down in the description box down below. Visible mending can today be seen as a way to reconnect to our clothes. As I mentioned earlier, the community building aspect is very important when it comes to mending, but especially when it comes to visible mending. But this is not the first time mending has been a community effort. Sajiko mending, which has become popular in the West in the recent couple of years, was traditionally in Japan the responsibility of women and girls who mended clothes for their family members. And the technique was often passed down from mother to daughter. And this leads us into the Japanese mending history section. Sashiku means little steps. 
According to textile historian Cynthia Shaver, the earliest findings of the sashiko stitching is from the 8th century, but like many other ancient uh, textile traditions, it's very hard to pinpoint its exact origin. Sashiko is believed to have been developed in poor communities in Japan's rural north during the Edo period and later spread south along the trade routes. Miho Takeuchi, a traditional sashiko instructor and designer born in Japan but nowadays based in the United States, says on Vox.com, it was born from the necessity of mending and patching garments, beddings and household items. In ancient days, clothing and bedding were made from homespun fabrics woven from native fibrous plants such as wisteria and hemp, and necessity demanded that this clothing be recycled for as long as possible. It wasn't until later the technique evolved into the elaborate patterns and the subtle level designs that we see today. In contrast to Japan's gorgeous silk tradition, Sashiku was seen as a folk textile because it was mainly produced and used by peasants. Japan's textile production wasn't industrialized until the 1870s and as such it was very important to use techniques such as sashiku to extend the life of homespun fabrics. Sashiku was work that women from farming and fishing families did during the colder winter months. They used the technique to extend the life of warm fabrics, mend, embellish, and sometimes also to make everyday items warmer to wear during the colder winter months. Sashiku was also a crucial part of another mending technique called boro, which means tattered rags in Japanese. Often traditional boro textiles contain multiple shades of indigo fabric patched or quilted neatly together with sashiku stitches making sure to cover holes and reinforce worn-out areas. Bora helped extend the life of garments and other household items. When garments were worn out, the fabric was then used to be quilted into workwear, and this technique also made garments both warmer and stronger. The women would quilt three layers together, where the oldest cloth in the middle where it still could be useful, but hidden away. Once the workwear made of boro was worn out, it was then turned into bags and aprons. Fabric from these items could then be quilted one last time into thick cleaning cloths, also known as sukin or fukin. Sashiko and boro was once upon a time devalued crafts associated with poverty and women's work. But they are now popular techniques with completely different meanings. Today, visible mending shows that you have the time and attention it takes to transform one's clothing into a statement. The first time I know of sashiko being reappropriated from being associated with poverty and women's work was when the high fashion designer Issey Miyake in 1973 used sashiko as part of his collection. As Japanese people started to wear more Western-style clothing in the 20th century, sashiko and boro, similar to the mending techniques in the West, fell out of favor for the modern and new. People didn't want to be reminded of how poor their families used to be. In recent years, when many people outside of Japan have wanted to try sashiko out, it has also simultaneously become more popular in Japan as a leisure activity as well. According to the site japancrafts.co.uk, outside of Japan, many people prefer to pick the traditional colors, like picking a cream thread and indigo fabric, but, and I hope this is true because I love this idea. Whereas in Japan, this is considered an old fashioned look and they prefer to pick other colors of fabric and thread instead. There are not many borrowed garments left, Today, they are highly sought after by designers and collectors that see great beauty in the garment's history and effect. Another non-Western mending technique which I had shared about here on my channel before is Kanta stitching, which originates from the West Bengal. I will link to that video in the cards as well as in the description box down below, so you can check that video out if you're interested. Otherwise, I do not know much at all about mending techniques and history of mending around the world. As I mentioned when I started to film this video, I focused mainly on Western Europe and North America whilst making this video because that was mainly the information I could find. 
find. But if you do know anything about mending in your country or anywhere else in the world, I would love to hear from you. And also, if you know anything that I didn't include in this video when it comes to the history of mending, leave also a comment down below. I would love to hear from you and continue the discussion and the education on the history of mending. And if you like this video, you most likely will like these videos over here as well. And until next time, bye! Bye.